25. Facts A conservative booklet, far superior to many, carries this title, The Facts That Will Save America, 1963. This title is an apt one in that it expresses a faith common to most people in the modern age. It is believed that the mind of man is good and untainted by sin, or at least neutral. All that man's mind needs in order to stand for the truth is a knowledge of the facts. In any crisis, therefore, the great need is for the facts to be made known. In order to understand what is involved in this false and dangerous opinion, let us begin by defining a few words. A fact, according to Feebleman, is an, quote, actual occurrence, an indubitable truth of actuality, a brute event, synonym with actual event, end quote. He defines knowledge thus, quote, relations known, apprehended truth, opposite of opinion. Certain knowledge is more than opinion, less than truth. Theory of knowledge or epistemology is the systematic investigation and exposition of the principles of the possibility of knowledge. In epistemology, the relation between object and subject, end quote, it would appear that Feebleman reflects the opinion of the modern age that facts are truth, that is, the brute facts of the natural world are truth in and of themselves, and knowledge is our apprehension of these facts. Lenny Bruce stated the matter on every man's level, quote, The religious leaders are what should be. Let me tell you the truth. The truth is what is. If what is is, you have to sleep it. Ten hours a day, that's the truth. A lie will be, people need no sleep at all. Truth is what is, end quote. In terms of this, the Kinsey reports have tried to give us the truth about sex, that is, what is, what people are actually doing. There is for them no truth beyond the natural world and its facts. There is a paradoxical sense in which the Christian can agree with this position. Truth is indeed what is, but the Bible makes it clear that only one fact can be so identified. God, God declared to Moses that his name is, I am that I am, Exodus 3.14, or he who is. Only God is self-existent. This is not true of any other fact, person or thing in the universe. I cannot legitimately say, I am, because I have not honestly described or identified myself thereby. To identify myself as I am is to lie, because the reality of the matter is that I am a creature, born in time, called to serve God, destined to die, and required to meet my Maker as also my judge. I cannot be identified in terms of myself as I am. I am a creature, a son, a husband, father, pastor, writer and much else, all in terms of God's sovereign purpose. What I am depends on God's electing and creating power and grace. To identify the facts of creation as, quote, brute facts, end quote, is thus to deny God's sovereignty over the creation of all things. It means that every fact is self-contained and, in effect, self-created, so that it is to be known as a thing in itself, not by reference to God. How deeply this perspective has saturated the modern world is apparent in the common complaint of young and old alike that they do not want to be seen or understood in terms of their calling as son or daughter, father or mother, husband or wife, student or workman, but only in terms of themselves, what they are in and of themselves. This is an existentialist viewpoint. It is an insistence that we are all brute facts and can only be known as brute facts. Salvation becomes deliverance from all binding ties into the position of brute factuality. Quote, know me only as I am, end quote, means know me existentially as a brute fact, totally unrelated to God or man. Not surprisingly, such a perspective is suicidal because man can only be known in terms of God and can only exist under God and 
in relationship to God's creation? To sever these ties is to deny life. To be a brute fact is to be meaningless, because man is not God, and man cannot remake himself and reality in terms of his imagination. Facts are what God made them. And the meaning of all things, including the meaning of our lives, can only be known in terms of God. A brute fact is a thing in itself, an unrelated fact, and when man seeks to be an unrelated fact, understandable only in terms of himself, he is seeking not only meaninglessness, but also total isolation. An existential fact is entirely in and of itself, so that, for Sartre, other people are the problem, they are the devil, because he is, as the brute existential fact, God, or at least a God in process of becoming God. The cry, know me only as I am, is a demand for brute existential status, but at the very same time it is a denial of it. God is self-contained. He needs nothing and no one. The cry to be understood in terms of ourselves is an anti-existential cry, even as it demands recognition as a brute fact because it asks for a relationship and despairs for lack of it. But a fact which needs relationship to other facts and or persons is not a brute fact, but a created and interdependent fact. Stentialists are thus deeply schizophrenic. There can be no continuity, relationship or meaning between fact and fact in a world of brute factuality, only accidental connections. By denying God and all continuity of relationships and meanings under God, they are denying reality and are in flight from it. Not surprisingly, insanity has been a major factor in modern thought, among philosophers and among artists and writers. These madmen include Nietzsche, Friedrich Hölderlin, Donizetti, Gerard de Neval, Robert Schumann, Nicolaus Lenau, and many others. Madness became a popular subject in the modern era because it gained a philosophical significance. Charles Naudier, the teacher of Victor Hugo and Alfred de Musset, held that insanity represents an upward step in the evolution of consciousness. Quote, Lunatics occupy the highest degree of the scale that separates our planet from its satellite, and since they communicate to this degree with a world of thought that is unknown to us, it is only natural that we do not understand them, and it is absurd to conclude that their ideas lack sense and lucidity, since they belong to an order of sensations and comprehensions which are totally inaccessible to us with our education and habits. End quote. R.D. Lang views madness as a bid for liberty, which it is indeed, liberty from God and man, freedom to be an unrelated and brute fact, yet one which the world depends on, rather than a fact interrelated to all other facts. Alan Harrington, in his study, Psychopaths, points out that psychopathic traits have assumed moral value. In Maddox's report, quote, one notes an appetite for absolute freedom, to do what one wants when one wants to. One registers the preference for disconnected, spontaneous living. One senses the weakening of social contract, of responsibility to any community except the community one improvises from day to day. Harrington seems half thrilled, half horrified at the prospect of a mental Big Bang. It's not so easy, not even good enough he writes, to take an overly righteous stand against a psychopath? Perhaps, he suggests, history, frantically looking for its transition to the future, can find no other solution. His not very happy conclusion, perhaps a mad god is better than none? For all his old-fashioned moderation in presenting his theme, for all his sneaking admiration for the psychopath, he is, at times, a sort of fellow traveller, Harrington is finally panicked by the subject that confronts him. The comparison springs to this mind for a horde of turned-on psychopaths. Genghis Khan's Mongols, 
Yet Harrington also knows how fatigued, how bored the reasonable have become with their reasonableness, and so the world teeters between a scream and a yawn. End quote. Madness has an appeal because it offers a pseudo-world wherein man becomes a supposedly existential fact. The lure of madness and the readiness of the modern mind to fall into it will only increase as long as the existential mentality prevails. The illusion of humanistic conservatives is that the world is controlled by high-level conspirators with highly sophisticated and rational plans. It must be asserted as against this that the various conspiracies reveal instead, whenever any aspect of them is uncovered, an existential madness. This same madness prevails in politics, among the people, in youth and in every sector of society. Especially since Darwin, man has felt unrelated to God and has been sped into his world of brute factuality and existential madness. In all of this, man has had a vivid foretaste of hell. Psychoanalytic, psychiatric and psychological studies are increasingly existentialist in their approach. Ludwig Binkswanger wrote that the existential research orientation in psychiatry arose from a dissatisfaction with the prevailing efforts to gain scientific understanding in psychiatry Psychology and psychotherapy as sciences are admittedly concerned with man, but not at all primarily with mentally ill man, but with man as such. The new understanding of man, which we owe to Heidegger's analysis of existence, has its basis in the new conception that man is no longer understood in terms of some theory, be it a mechanistic, a biologic or a psychological one. End quote. The study of, quote, man as such, in quotes, means man as a brute fact and an unrelated fact, a thing in itself. It becomes apparent once we recognise this governing presupposition why parents, teachers, pastors and the older generation are so readily blamed for the problems of individual man. Among other reasons, very clearly, an important one is that all these persons insist on a relationship to the individual and this is a central aspect of their sin. If they want a relationship, they can only be wrong. Existential philosophy, we are told, quote, determines the worth of knowledge not in a relation to truth, but according to its biological value contained in the pure data of consciousness when unaffected by emotions, volitions, and social prejudices. End quote. An existentialist psychology must therefore regard all such influences as relationships which are harmful to the individual's freedom and development. A major influence in the development of existentialist psychology was Kierkegaard, of whom May wrote, quote, The central psychological endeavour of Kierkegaard may be summed up under the heading of the question he pursued relentlessly, How can one become an individual? End quote. Precisely. Moreover, to quote, become an individual, end quote, meant for Kierkegaard to become a brute fact, an unrelated fact. Kierkegaard did succeed in becoming a psychopathic fact. In concluding unscientific postscript, Kierkegaard wrote, quote, When the question of truth is raised in an objective manner, reflection is directed objectively to the truth as an object to which the knower is related. Reflection is not focused upon the relationship, however, but upon the question of whether it is the truth to which the knower is related. If only the object to which he is related is the truth, the subject is accounted to be in the truth. When the question of the truth is raised subjectively, reflection is directed subjectively to the nature of the individual's relationship, if only the mode of this relationship is in the truth, the individual is in the truth, even if he should happen to be thus related to what is not true. End quote. May saw the point clearly. Quote, it would be hard to exaggerate how revolutionary these sentences were and still are for modern culture as a whole and for psychology in particular. 
Here is the radical, original statement of relational truth. Here is the fountainhead of the emphasis in existential thought on truth as inwardness, or as Heidegger puts it, truth as freedom, end quote. Truth as inwardness or truth as freedom means that truth is severed from its objective reference in favour of an inward reference. It explains too why revolutionary youth can disdain to study the facts because of its existential confidence that it is truth in action. In the existentialist world of Sigmund Freud, the problem of man is that his id, ego and superego have all been conditioned by the past and by the world around him. The goal of existentialist psychology is to free man from his past and from society into the freedom to become himself in terms of his own being. A first goal is thus, quote, the I am experience, to use May's term. However, quote, the I am, end quote, experience is not in itself the solution to a person's problems. It is rather the precondition to their solution, end quote. When May uses the term, quote, I am, end quotes, he does so self-consciously, knowing that he is citing Exodus 3.14. He is thus making man the new I am and the new ultimate fact with the power to become or to be divine. When man accepts his being, his existence, as the ultimate fact, he also recognises then, quote, that being is a category which cannot be reduced to interjection of social and ethical norms. It is, to use Nietzsche's phrase, quote, beyond good and evil, end quote. To the extent that my sense of existence is authentic, it is precisely not what others have told me I should be, but is the one Archimedes point I have to stand on from which to judge what parents and other authorities demand. Indeed, Compulsive and rigid moralism arises in given persons precisely as a result of a lack of a sense of being. Rigid moralism is a compensatory mechanism by which the individual persuades himself to take over the external sanctions because he has no fundamental assurance that his own choices have any sanction of their own. End quote. The biblical standards of good and evil require a relationship to God and man. They are indeed rigid because they are unchanging. May and other existentialist psychologists regard adherence to God's law as a denial of man's being and cowardice on the part of a man. For May, the ultimate law is a real one, but it is an inner law, a requirement to be free of God and man and to make one's freedom ultimate. Moreover, quote, My sense of being is not my capacity to see the outside world, to size it up, to assess reality. It is rather my capacity to see myself as a being in the world, to know myself as the being who can do these things. It is, in this sense, a precondition for what is called, quote, ego development, end quote. The ego is the subject in the subject-object relationship, the sense of being occurs on a level prior to this dichotomy. End quote. How can man, a creature born to die, make himself the end or purpose of his being? Strangely, the fact of death is used to make, quote, the individual existence real, absolute and concrete. End quote. Quote, the existential analysts hold that the confronting of death gives the most positive reality to life itself, for, quote, death as an irrelative potentiality singles man out and, as it were, individualizes him to make him understand the potentiality of being in others as well as in himself when he realizes the inescapable nature of his own death, end quote, Werner Brock. Death is, in other words, the one fact of my life which is not relative but absolute, and my awareness of this gives my existence and what I do each hour an absolute quality. End quote. Paul Tillich has said that quote, the self affirmation of a being is the stronger, the more non being it can take into itself. End quote. At this point, the existentialists begin to play games with themselves. Their world is circumscribed by I am 
that suddenly they increase the world to include the outside world, possibly other things in themselves? According to May, quote, We cannot describe world in purely objective terms, nor is world to be limited to our subjective, imaginative participation in the structure around us, although that too is part of being in the world. World is the structure of meaningful relationships in which a person exists and in the design of which he participates. End quote. Thus, we have introduced here a possibly hard and real world which exists apart from man and which has a design man never made, in which he merely, quote, participates, end quote. God, after being denied in favour of pure existence, is sneaked in the back door under the names of world and design. With an amazing lack of epistemological self-consciousness, existentialists, after beginning with the bare I am of Descartes' philosophy, reintroduce by stealth the whole of God's world while still denying God. May does not forsake his existentialism in reintroducing the world, quote, for to be aware of one's world means at the same time to be designing it, end quote. The world is still there, but it is in process of being absorbed into the being of man who becomes its shaper and designer. The origin of all this is in the Socratic Council, quote, Know thyself, end quote. Men, as the key to the universe, means ultimately that the universe is reduced to man, because only that which man's I am can comprehend is finally possible in that world. But man's, quote, I am, end quote, is absurd, and the conclusion of the matter is the disintegration of man and his philosophy. The Declaration of St. John in 1 John 2.20 is a radical denial of the existentialist premise. Quote, But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. End quote. The word know is in Greek oida, which, quote, suggests fullness of knowledge, end quote. For this reason, Moffat rendered it, quote, Now you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you possess all knowledge, end quote. When men are redeemed by Christ's atoning work, they have the illumination of the Holy Spirit to overcome the darkness of sin, and they know in principle the meaning of all things, that is, that they are God's handiwork and are to be understood in terms of Him. Calvin commented, quote, It hence follows that men are not rightly made wise by the acumen of their own minds, but by the illumination of the Spirit, and further, that we are not otherwise made partakers of the Spirit than through Christ, who is the true sanctuary and our only high priest. End quote. Since God is the maker of all things, nothing can be truly known apart from him. The fall of man was not only a fall from righteousness into sin, but also a fall from knowledge into ignorance and blindness. For the knowledge that God is, quote, I am that I am, end quote, he who is, man fell into the illusion that he himself is God, able to order the world after his imagination and to determine what constitutes good and evil in terms of his own will, Genesis 3.5. Man made himself the, quote, I am, end quote, the ultimate and determining fact of the universe, and then he proposed to save all creation by means of this fact. Man as ultimate, Man as the supreme fact. The history of fallen man is the development of the implications of this presupposition and their ruinous consequences. God alone is the, quote, I am, end quote, the brute and existential reality of the universe, deriving his eternal being from no one, needing no one, and totally self-sufficient in all his ways. God requires us to know him as he is, not merely in terms of our need of him. This means that we must know the ontological as well as the economical aspects of the Trinity. It means also that Arminianism is blasphemous because it treats God as a creaturely fact rather than the sole existential fact. The saying, quote, God has no hands but ours to use, end quote, reduces God to a creaturely fact, a fact dependent on and requiring other facts, 
man to accomplish his purposes. Not surprisingly, Arminianism and Thomism lead to an existentialism which makes man the new god of creation and seeks to abolish the god of scripture, 